just out of country, not even six hours. And there was this demonstration. People were yelling at us, like baby killers and all the- San Francisco people coming off the plane, you know, being our best, and went racing to change uniforms so they didn't get healthy with eggs and stuff. But nobody's saying anything, but the glares were there, and uh, it was clearly, what are you doing here wearing a uniform? On the older veterans, I think, by and large, bought into the issue that the veterans had failed. The Legion and the VFW, oh, that's not a war, you know, it was, it, it was played down by the, the, these vets. We were rejected, we were maligned as the, uh, as the problem. There wasn't any embrace into the bosom of a grateful nation. And that's the way it was. And that's the way it remained. I think that most of the Vietnam vets felt that uh, their interests weren't necessarily uh, the highest priority with the uh, traditional veterans groups, and and so led to a lot of uh, different uh, Vietnam veterans organizations. The Vietnam Veterans of America being one of them, but its predecessor was called the Council of Vietnam Veterans, and because they didn't represent anybody, Bobby Mueller and the Council of Vietnam Vets were sort of embarrassed at a, a Senate hearing and we asked who they represented, nine people, <laughs> and that, that was the genesis of the creation of the VBA. It wasn't about politics, it was about our service and making sure that the weakest of us uh, would be taken care of on a national level. The, the local chapter, Manhattan Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, was uh, loosely organized in the early 80s and then became uh, more formal uh, around 1983. The commission uh, started its work around the same time on a parallel track. I was thought of it at touch. Um, without him, there'd be no memorial. When I became uh, mayor, uh, my um, counsel, counsel to the mayor was uh, Pat Mulhern, and uh, he uh, was uh, someone who either became acquainted with or already uh, knew. Uh, Scott Higgins and uh, Bernie Edelman and uh, Jim Heverin, uh, and uh, it was they uh, who uh, came up with uh, the original idea of uh, the monument. So he appointed a uh, study group, which I co-chaired with another fellow, uh, which then grew into uh, a commission. It's some really talented people uh, that really focus on it from advertising, public relations, we got heads of uh, organizations that uh, Vietnam Vets and others. How we constructed the Memorial Commission is that each position had uh, a leader in their own rights in that field and a Vietnam Vet. So for example, we had Scott Higgins along with Donald Trump as co-chairs. Put together something called the Trump Challenge, which was that if New Yorkers put up a million dollars, then uh, Donald would write a check for a million. Bill Morris raised half a million dollars they gave us a quarter million because they raised a quarter million, so that's half a million, which is halfway towards Donald's million dollar challenge grant. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great effort, and we ended up raising uh, nearly five million dollars before it was over. So it was a great outpouring. There was a special group put together, they toured open spaces. And uh, this particular spot, formerly Jeanette Park, was chosen. There was some resistance uh, to the monument uh, by adjacent land uh, owners who uh, didn't want it sitting right smack in the plaza. <laughs> and if you're the mayor, you're like a eight pound gorilla, as they say, and you get your way. When we did the, the design committee, we created a philosophy committee who would, a subcommittee who would really try to develop what this would really be about. Second part, we had a rules committee, then we had a group that looked at the history of monuments, and then we had our overall uh, group of people that were going to vote on the selection. So we tried to really capture what people wanted. The winning design stipulated a glass block and granite wall onto which would be etched information, something about the war. The determination had been made that we wanted to bring in original writings from during the war, not uh, a novel, not somebody's oral history or a memoir or anything like that. We had an avalanche of material coming in. We also had, I believe it was a half dozen offers from publishing houses that wanted to do a book. Uh, the book 
begat a movie of the same name that won HBO, two of its first three Emmys. Um, and all of it serves, I think, to help people understand what the human landscape of Vietnam was about. It's not about politics. It's not about facts and figures and numbers. It's about the young men and women who served. I was a blur. It, it, we worked right up to the very end, and we had certain issues right down to the night before as to whether something was going to work or not, and lighting. It was a lot of risk, uh, but the biggest risk was taken by the mayor of the city of New York. Thousands of people, loads of press. All the best are out there, you know, really reverent. Light it up, Ed! Light it up! <laughs> the switch that the mayor you know, clicked would actually light one side of the world. On the other side of the wall was the Christian with myself, with the radio saying, now. And turning on the lights was that particular moment that was of highest magnitude. The uh, unusual thing about the Welcome Home Parade was the idea came from an English woman who had lost her father in World War II, Catherine Saxton. And she realized that in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam veterans did not come back en masse. They came back singly. And they, were re they really never had their parade. So she put forth the idea. But most people were skeptical because it was, after all, at that time, nine and a half years after the end of the war. And the question was, well, we could have a parade, but would anybody show up? Mayor Koch and, uh, and the, uh, the commission uh, worked tremendously hard uh, to open all the barriers that uh, were the, uh, the obstacles towards achieving the kind of freedom of uh, motion, if you will, in lower Manhattan. Uh, the NTA uh, employees couldn't have been uh, more helpful. <laughs> the turnstiles just smoked. It started in Brooklyn, in Cadman Plaza. There were lots of people there, lots of veterans, dressed every which way, some in the fatigues they wore. There were police officers and firemen. There were guys dressed as businessmen. Uh, Mayor Koch led the parade together with uh, a Medal of Honor winners who were there. And uh, we went over the Brooklyn Bridge and there was a flyover of helicopters. It was really... <laughs> Extraordinary and its impact, beauty. People met there, the chopper buddy people met people all over the place. Was, the city was amazing. 25,000 troops marched, and uh, over a million New Yorkers were there to welcome them home. They needed it as much as the people marching. The parade itself was the kickoff for a sequence of national parades in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington that, uh, uh, that uh, picked up the energy that we had created here. Uh, to, uh, to give us that which we had not uh, gotten a uh, welcome home. We wanted to do not only a physical memorial but also a living memorial and uh, it, as we dug into this whole issue we found that New Yorkers uh, who were Vietnam veterans represented a, a, a thousands and thousands of those who were unemployed or underemployed. And the, the result was 35,000 veterans who received skills uh, that they hadn't received uh, prior, mostly computer skills, and it helped uh, raise the level of uh, employment for Vietnam veterans here in the city. When we started getting involved with other issues, we were involved in the, um, the opening of the um, Office of Veterans Affairs uh, through the city of New York and we attacked the homeless situation in the early 80s, the mid 80s and through the 90s, uh, New York City, a third of the homeless 
people on the streets were Vietnam veterans. One of the things that we were able to do was, as a group, as a coalition, uh, work with the mayor's office and help get the uh, Borden Avenue shelter started. It's a shelter in Queens for homeless people. Specifically, uh, there's a, a, a way for veterans to be able to get some help. Part of the of the living memorial was the outreach to uh, to save those homeless veterans. And the chapter uh, did fundraising. The chapter supplied a lot of the staffing and a lot of the uh, uh, the thought processes that went in uh, to resolving the problem. Uh, and it helped us stay together. Over the years, it deteriorated. The, the park, that park, um, and the memorial itself started to decay. It wasn't really being uh, kept up. And the wall was getting worse and worse, and nobody was maintaining it. In 1998, uh, when President Joe Graham uh, took hold, uh, he it made it the, uh, the focus of the chapter. I went over to 55 Water Street. What I had in mind was to, to uh, build a consensus within the community and get the wall out of there. Harry Bridgewood, who was the a building manager, he says, I'm pretty sure we're getting ready to do a renovation of the plaza. He managed to get the owners of the property, the Alabama Teachers uh, Fund, I believe they contributed three and a half million dollars. Uh, Mayor Giuliani contributed a million dollars out of his budget. Um, the Downtown Alliance helped raise money and, and we had a group. We decided that we wanted to do a little bit more than what was already there. We wanted to um, add a, an educational piece to it, which uh, is a map. In addition to that, we added the names of those who served in Vietnam and were killed. All representatives of the mosaic that makes up our city. Many, many, many Hispanics, many, many, many Blacks, Arab Americans or Americans of Arab descent on that wall too. It, it reflects what, uh, what our culture is about, our, our city is about. We contacted hundreds of family members of the deceased and we had all this big event planned and all this big, big event and then what happened, 9-11 hits. We originally were going to go in September. 911 happened then. Now we were, I mean, we were sh in shock and we were in mourning. The next thing we know is that we're getting calls, so please hold the event, please hold the event, because it's the very first event that's going to be held in the Wall Street area. And it's basically like, hey, we're back. So we were really urged to help, you know, to hold this event. And we did. And we celebrated that. And it was a fantastic day. We had a very successful opening uh, of the uh, memorial as it, as it stands right now. And we felt when we finished that, that uh, we still had more to do. This is our birthday party for the chapter. And it's also the, n the next phase. Our job isn't finished. The memorial, the way it stands now, uh, will need constant attention. Uh, we're, we are the obvious group that will give it that attention, but at some point in 50 years or so, uh, who's to say that it would still get the attention that it would need? And that's why I think it's important for it to, get, for it to be um, furnished, you know, improved, and cleaned up, whatever it needs to be done, and done on a regular basis. And that's one reason we're trying to do is raise money, make sure we have enough uh, money in perpetuity to do that. To make sure that people in generations to come, hundreds of years from now, will be able to come back to it and read about, it, read these letters and get a feeling for what it was like to be there. And it makes a difference in what war. They gave their lives. And it's important to mark that and to remember it. There are some we don't know where they are. They didn't come home. They are lost, missing forever. And we need to remember them also. This is something that is timeless. And it's something that our children and our children's grandchildren hopefully will come and see and understand. And as long as New York City exists, the memorial should exist.